Good afternoon, everybody. It is a, a pleasure, certainly an honor, and I think a privilege to be back home, and especially giving uh, this keynote uh, lecture. Uh, it's humbling, certainly. And especially after I've been trying to come back to Guelph for so long, um, partly my fault, I guess I wasn't really good at uh, getting everything aligned, but uh, we ended up doing it, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks again to, to the organizing committee, especially Dr. Terry, who did a lot of work to get this together, put this together, uh, and for considering me for today, for today's uh, keynote lecture. This, this lecture, I thought, I kind of spent quite a, few, quite a few hours, maybe quite a few days, thinking about how to address uh, this, uh, when I see the title, I kind of say, huh, I should have changed that title. And I think I changed that title many times in my mind. Uh, but I said, let's do a mixture of both a little bit of science and a little bit of my experience, like uh, Dr. Friendship said, uh, with PIC and throughout the years. I want to start with uh, just showing you some pictures uh, from this. These pictures were taken between 2002 and 2004. And I guess I still have that, uh, well, it doesn't work, that Canadian uh, soccer jersey with me. I use that uh, every now and then. But then you have the picture with the, with the yellow shirts. Those are Colombian soccer yellow, yellow shirts uh, from the soccer team. But I can say that we were the first curling, the Colombian, the first Colombian curling team ever, perhaps. <laughs> um, so that was quite an experience. And then you see three other pictures of, uh, of what uh, we did a lot with uh, Drs. Vladimir, Karen, you're here. Um, and uh, you may recognize others from those pictures. The reason why I show this is this was this experience, this two year, uh, two year experience in Guelph was pretty enriching. And I think that changed my mindset a lot. And that prepared me very well for the upcoming years. Now, let me just give you a brief, uh, what I plan to do today is just give you a very general introduction of how I see the industry today. Then I'm going to share with you challenges from my point of view as well as opportunities and I'll just wrap it up with a, with a very simple summary. When we look at the industry, and I'm sure you all have way more experience than me, but when I look at the industry, I think we have moved from different spots, but I can see that in the past, people would just raise pigs for mainly one reason, right? Just for their own consumption. And yeah, we would just have them outside, very normal pens. Maybe you, you guys in the back may not see the picture. But then we ended up in this, you know? It kind of became a, a family business. We kind of started looking into efficiency and very simple terms as uh, how many liters per cell per year. So we went from one, one five, one eight, to now we talk about 2.5 liters per year. So that's a tremendous advancement, right? Now, when we look at pigs per sow per year, I remember when I started reading about pig production, the goal at that time maybe was 20, 22, 24. Well, not right now we're looking at low 30s or mid 30s. Maybe some others are looking at uh, high 30s pigs per sow per year. So we can see that there's quite a lot of momentum in there, and uh, it will be interesting in a few years from now, and we'll see where these numbers go. Now, when we look at, the, at farm structure, we can see that we went from very small groups, of course, because we had very few sows, and then we started looking at all of these barns with 1,000, 2,000, 10,000 pigs in the same site. So that has created a lot of different uh, or that has made clear that we needed to learn way more about pig production and pig health. And this is where the swine veterinarian role continues to evolve, you know. I might be wrong, this may not be very inclusive, and uh, we can have a conversation about this, but I guess in the past, veterinarians would focus, yes, on health in smaller herds, and then they would do the technology transfer whenever they would go to these farms. But the interesting thing is that in the past, they would be talking to the decision maker who was also the caregiver, right? So I think that was kind of an interesting point. And at the same time, they would charge for what they did at that time, 
castration, vaccination, sample collection, that nah, might not have changed too much today. But the visits, you know, I think the visits were just related to, like in, in, in bovine practice today, the dystocia cow, well, here it was about the sick animal. When we look at it today, I think the three main points, they stay the same, more or less. However, we tend to see a shift in the caregiver. And the reason why I'm pointing out this is because nowadays, the swine practitioner needs to get all these prevention or control plans implemented, well, they have a different kind of team in the sense that this team may be paying more attention to detail in some cases, or maybe not, and, but at the same time, they would be able to be more, uh, that, that attention to detail might be better. Now, they will be charging for what they know, of course, I think that makes total sense, but this is another change. They wouldn't be going there when there was only a fire, no? We, we came into a routine visit uh, like uh, process in that we would be able to take for, uh, control in a better way. So that's how I see the industry today. But then all these changes have created certain challenges, right? And when I say challenges, I just have, I just brought like three, two challenges and I kind of conducted a very small survey that I want to share with you. But I'm sure there's way more challenges than the ones I'm going to I'm going to talk to you about today. I'm going to use an example, which is a, a, a program that, he's, that it's being conducted uh, in the United States, who was started by Dr. Bob Morrison, a Canadian veterinarian who, uh, who migrated to the United States and had been working with the University of Minnesota for quite a while, who unfortunately passed away last, uh, pretty much a year ago. And Dr. Morrison said, well, we need to get all these producers together so that we can learn more about the industry, so that we can learn more about diseases. So I'm gonna use this program, which uh, I'm honored to lead today, uh, which basically tracks disease on pretty much 50% of the breeding herd in the United States. And I'm gonna use it because I think it, it kind of helps me tell the story. So today, when we look at PERS, and I think Canada may fall into the same, the same scenario, we know that we have kind of a predictable pattern. So this graph that you see here, this is a graph that is generated every week that we share with participants and not participants in which we track the, um, the proportion of herds that become infected throughout the year. So for the Morrison Swine Health uh, Monitoring Project, the year starts in July and it, and it uh, ends in June. <coughs> Excuse me. And you can see that Somewhere between October and November, <coughs> there's an increase in the number of herds that become infected. So we have a predictable pattern. If we take this data and we look at it from a different standpoint, in a different, through a different uh, way of, of, of analyzing the data, we have used here the same process that the Centers for Disease Control use to track influenza in humans. This is what we call the EWMA, the Exponential Weighted Mean Average, in the sense that it helps us look at the data in a different manner. And we kind of generate a baseline, right? This red line is, let's take it as a baseline. And we know that if we go above that baseline, we are under an outbreak, right? So here you can see, you won't be able to see the dates, but all, this, all these little boxes, they represent the date in which the line, in other words, the amount of farms that broke was different to the previous weeks. So you can see that pretty much is October, October, November, October, consistently throughout the years. The point I wanna make with this is that the challenge is there. We know that PERS breaks every fall around these dates, and we have still haven't been able to change that consistent pattern. Yeah, you can see that the peak, the highest the peak, the more herds that broke in that specific week, the peak has gone down a little bit, and this might be explained by the amount of herds that uh, have been included throughout time. So here we should have around 300, almost 400 uh, sow herds, and here we may have close to 1,000. So that kind of dilutes that estimate, but still, we continue to see the whole population going through an epidemic starting pretty much in the same week of the year. When we look at this data from a different standpoint, 
And when we look at that database and we start counting how many outbreaks every breeding herd has had since they joined the program, you can see that, yeah, 40% of them haven't, had, haven't reported an outbreak. Well, this is kind of a, it could be biased information in the sense that not every herd was at risk for the nine years that the program has been uh, functional. But it also tells us that there's been some herds that they continue to get hit every year. And for those of you that have seen PERS outbreaks and that have gone through uh, PERS elimination programs, it takes a year, year and a half to clean the whole system. Well, there might be some farms that they never clear that field virus, and they again get hit with another strain. When we look at that, we can see that 58% of those herds, if they break today, they will break again within a year. Now, again, why do I bring this? Well, we know that if we break today, and if I'm, if I'm gonna be breaking within a year, and I know that there's this repetitive trend, am I changing things? Am I actually putting more biosecurity processes? You would think that we, we would be doing that, and I'm sure there's some systems that do that, but we can see that the data tells us completely opposite things, right? Now, I think that we're getting better at preventing disease. The, I, I think that's true, don't get me wrong. Not everything is bad, but we see this trend. And also we're getting better at eliminating disease, right? So this is just a graph of uh, six different systems, participating systems in this project in which we have calculated the number of weeks uh, that it takes the farms from each system to clear PERS from the reading herd. So for example, system A, we can see that in pretty much in average, some, somewhere around 40 to 45 weeks, that's the average for that system that it takes from the moment they intervene the farm to the moment they declare the, the farm free of that wild type virus. We can see that there's, yeah, there's, some, there's a range in there, but then when you compare across systems, you can see that there's quite an interesting variability in the sense that, yeah, one or two weeks, uh, some, some people will not care about one or two extra weeks, some others will, because one extra week of purse positive pace may cost them a lot of money in the growing finishing side. So it's interesting to see how within the system there's viability and how across the system is viability. Again, another challenge. Why, if I have pretty much the same, the same people in the farm, same kind of, um, um, resources, why some farms take longer than others? That's kind of a tricky question that we're trying to, trying to understand. Now, we also are wondering, what's the season, what's the relation between season and eliminating disease? Well, this is a graph trying to show us if I break in the fall, I might be able to eliminate the virus faster than if I break in the summer. Right? It may take me a little longer, five, 10 weeks, but again, an extra week of winning positive, first positive picks may cost you a lot of money. Yeah, there's a significant difference between seasons, but still, we need to understand why are these things happening in our farms. If we have the same resources, the same technology, the same diagnostics, uh, the only difference is gonna be, I guess, the, 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 the level of the employees, the, the quantity of the employees in these farms, and of course, location. Let's switch to another challenge, and I call this the industry structure. Uh, and what I mean by the industry structure is how we have shifted our production systems from one side to multiple sites and so on. But again, we're always trying to pursue profitability, which makes total sense. I guess everybody wants to make money today. Of course, this is a business, and uh, we're always after minimizing those costs of productions. Why? Because we want to optimize all these resources. I mean, we don't have infinite resources. And then this is when marvelous ideas by Dr. Tom Alexander, who by the way was here in Guelph at some point, he understood that if he would separate recently weaned pigs from the adult population, performance would be much better. So I think that was an awesome discovery, okay? But that made us shift from one side systems to multiple size systems. So in other words, we would be having more pig farms 
in pretty much in the same region. And when we look at the region, and this is a kind of a very old map, but this is just to highlight where the pegs more or less are around the world, we can see that there's regions of very high density. And I, need to, I don't need to explain where in Canada or where in the United States or where in, in the Americas we would see that high density. But what I'm trying to say is that little by little, this got populated, and I don't see this slowing down. I think this, all these density, very dense areas, they continue to grow, they continue to expand. So in other words, we continue to put barns next to 10 other barns. So I think we need to shift that because I think we have created a fire. You know, I think we have created a fire in the sense that we think that we only own this finite piece of land and that we can only put our barns in there. Well, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But then we should think a little bit through this whole process and think, well, how could I minimize the risk of disease introduction into my herd? Well, I think that if we start decreasing density, and I don't know how we can do that because I think nobody's gonna be uh, getting rid of their farms soon, uh, we should think about that. How can we decrease density? And I have an idea in, in which I'm gonna share with you in a few slides. Now, we continue to optimize, as, just, as I just mentioned, and how are we optimizing? Well, this is a very old graph, but I think it makes the point in the sense that we may be having fewer farms, but those are becoming larger and larger farms. And this is just an example. This is an example of breeding herds, both in North America, uh, actually they're all in North America, in the US and in Mexico, in which at some point we thought, yeah, a 3,000 sow herd, a breed to wean was a large farm. Well, now we can see 6,300 sows in the same side, or now we can see 11,000 11, or 16,000 sows in the same side. My point with this is that even though we're trying to optimize resources, we're taking these populations or we're making these populations so big, so large, so compartmentalized that when disease hits, it makes, it, 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 it gives, gives us an issue, which is how can we eliminate disease from these farms? So I personally was involved with a PED elimination project in this side, uh, and I can tell you, this was very hard to get, to get rid of because we had so many farrowing rooms, we have so many people that putting, aligning all th those two factors together was really, really hard. So that's one thing that we need to have to, to keep in mind. What's, what's large? What is too large? Where should we draw the line? Because I can see that people get, get excited about having more pigs and more pigs in the same area if the permits allow them to do that. But then from a production standpoint, from an economics standpoint, that makes total sense. But then from a disease standpoint, I think that's going to be, that's, that's already being an issue. Now, yep, we know that uh, we can be good from an economic standpoint. But just think about, we're going to have more people going in and out. So that's, we will be opening the doors of those farms way more often. We're going to have way more numbers of days, so we maybe have to wean every single day. That means trucks coming in and out. Also, we might need to have more employees doing the breeding every, every day. We may have to have more trucks delivering feed. We're going to have to have a way better mortality management program. And also, guilt introduction. So just imagine, if you were used to bringing in 1,000 gills per year, you're going to have to start bringing in, for, for example, for this 16,000 sow farm, 8,000 gills per year. So that means that you're going to have to have an isolation barn, you're going to have to go through some testing. So that requires a lot of engineering behind that. Now, we know that they may get infected or they may get PERS, PD, eliminating disease is the key part here. Because yeah, we might be good at keeping it out, but that doesn't work 100% of the time. So, and that's, that's the question I have today. Are we ready to 
manage these large populations under one roof? Are we building those, those farms in a way that we set them up for disease elimination down the road? And I think that's the question that we need to go through several times. Let me finish this challenge part with this mini survey um, of seven U.S. veterinarians. They have, a, they have a different background, working in different regions across the United States. And I kind of went to them and I asked them, what, is, what are your concerns? What are your top three concerns for the swine industry? You can see that there's four practitioners and there's two that they were, of course, in academia, but they also do some extension work. And you can see that depending on the veterinarian, you would see the difference in responses. For example, you would see that people would show up uh, every now and then, that, that, that might be one of the most popular ones, either if it was the high turnover or if it was related to the training procedures. Also, PERS would show up in there. Also, uh, foreign animal disease introduction. So you can see that depending on the veterinarian, we would see a different set of challenges. Of course, I have my own challenges, they have their own challenges, but at the end of the day, I think all of them are gonna be linked together. Let me move to opportunities. So when I say opportunities, they may overlap with some challenges, I guess. I see some of them uh, today very clear, and one of them is people. When I say people, farm employees, and I think the veterinarian also has some opportunities in there. Pig flow, we'll talk a little bit about it, transport biosecurity, and something that it has been introduced that it's called competition. And I'm sure, again, there are way, way more opportunities in the industry today. So when it comes to people, I think today the swine industry, unlike any other industry, is going to have different options of who do they hire, right? Do they hire the high skilled uh, individual that is uh, very motivated, or do they hire the one individual that has no experience with a lot of theory in their heads? Well, I think you're going to have to hire both of them at, at some point. Because at the end of the day, and this, is, this may sound a little bit harsh, but to me, the worst thing that can happen to a pig farm is to having people in there, having humans in a pig farm, uh, because we're, all of our processes are human driven, and if disease gets into a farm, I think most likely it's because we have done something wrong, unless there might be some airborne transmission, yeah, but I think we are responsible for the doors, we are responsible for the feed, for the transport, for which animals come in, so that's when I say, people may have been the worst thing that can happen to a pig farm today. Why? Because all these individuals that work in the pig farm, they have to take care of all of this, right? And I wonder if, and I'm sure you have wondered this before, how compliant they are with all their tasks. And an example of this is from the swine head monitoring project, we monitor purse through time and we know which herds break and in which purse status were they, or which purse category. So for those of you who are not familiar with purse categories, the, the American Association of Swine Veterinarians created this one purse category in which a number would be given depending on the status. So those farms that are very clean, that, don't have, that haven't had contact with purse, they're gonna be status four, and those that are uh, going through an outbreak or that have been recently been infected, they're gonna be status one. I'm here showing the number, of, sorry, the proportion of herds, status four herds, in other words, naive farms that have had an introduction every, well, not every year, but on year 2009, 2010, 11, and so forth. This is a 5%, 10%, 15, and 20%. So if you look at this graph, of course, there's different amount of, uh, we have different number of herds across the years, but you can see the amount of farms from status four category that break. These are farms located in remote areas, one, and these are herds that, are, that have high levels of biosecurity standards, but still they break. So there's no question that airborne transmission may not be the case in here because they are quite isolated. So why do they break? Which which was the mistake we made at some point? Was it the truck? Was it the animals? Was it the semen? Was it, the, was it uh, something that was contaminated? And this is what I mean with people being the worst thing that can happen to a pig farm. Again, this has been seen in other industries. Uh, 
Jean-Pierre Valcourt and the, and, and the team in Montreal, they did kind of an analysis. They went out there and looked at the biosecurity measures in the poultry industry and how compliant are they. Perhaps some of you have seen these papers, and this is exactly what I mean. I wonder if we go to a pig farm today and if we start following individuals, are we going to be able to find those mistakes and how often and which day of the week and throughout the season, uh, throughout the year, are we going to see more mistakes than other days? So that's one question that I have that we're going to try to address at some point. Now, this is not new, you know. We humans, we're not the most disciplined individuals, and especially when it comes to our own health. And I got this example from, the, from human medicine in the sense that, for example, individuals that have tuberculosis, they need to take one pill of an antibiotic per day, something like that. And for you to be successful with, with, with that treatment is that you have to be 100% compliant, right, for your treatment. Well, when you look at the literature, you see that depending on, your, on the condition you're dealing with, you're going to have non-compliant individuals in the sense that that non-adherence to prescribed treatment occurs quite often either in adults or in pediatric medicine. What does this tell us? If we are not compliant with our own health or our own treatment, what can we expect at the farm level, right? So that's another opportunity that we have in the pig farms, right? And simple questions like this. Do you wash your hands every day before a meal? So I wonder today how many individuals wash their hands before they had lunch? I didn't. Oh, I can see some hands there. That's good. Well, two out of 100 and something. Um, or do you follow 100% your physician recommendations? So did you change diet? Did you start exercising? Did you stop the, doing something that was not beneficial for you? That's the kind of question that I would like to address at some point, because I think at some point we're going to have less and less people at the, on pig farms, and we need every single individual to be very compliant with their tasks. Now, what I'm saying is not all bad news. I think we have, I think we have good examples out there in the sense that if you hire the right individual, and if you're able to maintain these individuals motivated so that you can have a low turnover and a good level of discipline, I think it can be done, you know? And I'm showing just an example of Dr. Larry Coleman, a veterinarian in Nebraska, who works with this system. I think there should be around 15 to 20,000 sows today, in which through people management and being very picky at how they select their employees, they have been able to achieve a very impressive numbers from a production standpoint. Of course, you might not be able to see this table, and this is just to show you that we have three sets of farms in here, Prairie Dog Hill, Pigeon Ranch, Georgetown. This last one is an electronic south feeding uh, system. And I wanna point out two things. First of all, average total born. This is, this first column is week, the last five weeks, uh, the last four weeks in average, 13 weeks, 52 weeks, and 104 weeks for this farm. If we look at it, I mean, we're pretty much touching the 16th total born. And when we look at pigs per sow per year, per male female, they're hitting the mid 30s. What does this mean? That it can get, it can be done, right? I'm sure it's gonna take time, it's gonna take resources, but you can get it done. Yes, they're purse free, micro free, there might be some influence in there, but like any other farm, they may have also PCV2, but they're just really good at it. I had the opportunity to visit that farm, and it's just amazing to see all the farm crew, they would stop to talk to you, maybe for a few minutes, but they knew that the more time they would spend with you, the less time they would have at the farrowing house, making sure that there were no pigs being laid on. So I think it can be done, you know. The other opportunity that I have, it's something very simple, you know, and it's more, more from, a, from an engineering standpoint, more from a, a, a production, uh, production system standpoint, and I call it the pig flow. Well, today I think we have one of the most powerful tools for controlling and eliminating pathogens at the breeding herd level, which I don't know if we use that often, or maybe we don't have that many opportunities, but when you look at PERS, 
yeah, I think we're going to have a lot of opportunities there, unless you just don't want to eliminate because you're in, a, in the middle of a high dense region. And it's something that is called herd closure. Herd closure was introduced in the early 2000s, yes, in the sense that we needed a way to control and eliminate birds faster. Very simple flow, very simple terminology, but I'm just surprised with the few, the few instances in which you talk about this and some people haven't heard about it. And yeah, this means that we're gonna have to stop introducing guilds that either come externally or internally. Yeah, that's gonna create a cost, but when we look at the benefits of eliminating disease, they, I'm sure they're gonna be better than the cost. Within PIC, uh, within my five years of PIC, maybe I was the worst uh, salesman for PIC, in the sense that I asked a lot of producers to close their herds just to get control over their system, because at some point we had two or three strains of birds circulating in that breeding herd. And controlling that scenario is pretty complicated. We can vaccinate every single day, but we may not have an impact as we would have with herd closure. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind, this is completely different to what some people refer to closed herd. A closed herd may only take semen or they're gonna be raising their own guilds internally. So those are two different uh, terms in there. I've used this, and others have used this, as a, as a pathogen elimination strategy. Yeah, it, it, it could be a headache at some point. You're gonna have to figure out, you're gonna have to do a lot of pig flow engineering, but it can be done for different diseases, right? And when you start seeing the changes in the population, you'll see that from a performance standpoint, yeah, let's say that you were doing very well, performance was good, then you go through an outbreak, you do the closure, but then, the, that growing pig population starts showing a better performance. So I don't have the data, I just have some numbers, very anecdotal experiences, but you can tell that mortality rates and growth rate and feed conversion improve four or five months after the closure. And if you wait a little longer, that is gonna improve a little bit, a little bit more. So the question is, besides eliminating PERS or PED, are we eliminating any other bacteria? So I saw the, the presentation, the strep suis presentation. That might be one that we should be looking at in the sense of when we do her closure, are we eliminating viruses and some bacteria that may be uh, generating some cost to these animals? But then the other issue is, okay, I can do the closure, I can eliminate the big bugs, maybe I'll eliminate the smaller ones, the, the, the early colonizers, and what's gonna happen when I bring in guilds again? That's another piece of the puzzle that we need to figure out, but I see that as an, oppor as an opportunity. Now, this will for sure help us reduce antibiotic usage. Why? Because we don't need them. The pigs are so healthy that you're not gonna have to use any CTCs or amoxicillin to try to control disease because we're gonna be increasing survivability and of course our nutrition teams Dr. Silstra will be very, very happy to see feed conversion going down, of course. And then our production team and the, the finance team, of course, they're gonna love seeing how production cost is gonna go down. And this is true, you know, because we've done quite a lot of uh, herd closures in the past and they see the difference. So in a system that had 50,000 sows, we did kind of a system-wide herd closure in a year we were able to return to that one system, $1.2 million, just because we decreased mortality. So when you put those numbers in people's head, in productions, in, in, in producers' head, that makes total sense. Now, let me go into opportunity number two from a production standpoint, from a pig flow production standpoint. Everybody knows that this is not new. Our industry is on wheels, just as an example, and I'm sure that we can get, I couldn't find one from, an example from Canada, but this is just to show you a very old, uh, kind of an old reference on how pig flow from North Carolina to other states occurred, or how many, how many uh, sources of pigs Minnesota would get. This means that we're moving every, well, I shouldn't say every pathogen, but I, I, I wanna say, what I'm trying to say is we're moving pigs from different health status into the same region, into the same neighborhood. Again, to that high dense region. 
and then we expect them to perform really well. Yeah, we're going to vaccinate them for PERS, for flu, Lausonia, PCV2, but then we know that they're going to be challenged at some point. So again, that fire that we have created at some point in these high dense regions, we continue to kind of complicate by just the influx of pigs from different areas in the, in, in, in the country. Now, I wonder if we can segregate or switch sites, and I'm going to explain what that means. It's easy to say and hard to do, but from my experience at the University of Minnesota as I was starting my PhD and as I was helping with the PERS regional control projects, I saw a couple of opportunities, a couple of examples in which producers would trade their sites to protect the neighborhood if a group of pigs would become positive for PERS. What I'm trying to say with this is, if I have a region with different, with multiple sources, so every color represents a source, and if I try to change that flow into a, let's say, a better organized flow, it's not going to be perfect, but if I can try to segregate from a regional standpoint the sources, that may help us a little bit better, because we're going to have to see if proximity is an issue, yeah, here proximity might be an issue too, but it might be a better or an organized issue, if you will. And we kind of saw that in the Stevens County Regional Project, which was that first, uh, that second first regional control project in Minnesota, in the sense that we were they were able to protect the region, the neighborhood, by just switching sites and keeping those infectious individuals away from the susceptible population. Now, when we look at how we move piglets, or how we move skills, or how we move market weight pigs? Well, the question is, do every producer wash their truck every time they have been in contact with a slaughter plant? And you may hear a lot of different answers when you ask this question, and a lot of them would say it depends, right? They will do that for breeding stock pigs, right? So I guess there's a reason why you do that. You will do that perhaps for weaning pigs, right? When you're moving them from side one to, from the breeding herd to the nursery or to the wean to finish barn. So there might be a reason for that too. What about nursery and market pigs? Do they wash them every single time they do it? The answer is gonna be maybe, the likelihood of the answer being no is gonna be pretty high. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that every now and then when you start pulling out pigs from a, from a wing to market, uh, wing to finish barn, on the first cut, you may not see anything, but maybe on the second cut, you're gonna start see the remaining pigs breaking. What does that mean? Shedding. And when I say shedding, we're gonna start seeing PED, Delta coronavirus, and they're gonna start shedding not only on site, but also on the truck and then in the slaughter plant. The more pigs we have shedding, and the more pigs we move that are shedding, the more we're going to contaminate everything, if you want to call it that way. So I wonder if, if at some point we should reconsider our processes. Some people would say, yeah, it costs me too much to wash a truck every time I go to the slaughter plant. Well, it may cost you less if you look at it from an outbreak frequency or from an outbreak standpoint. So I think that's something that we need to, we need to look at. In closing, let me just summarize all this with uh, just with a few thoughts. We're going to have an industry that continues to evolve. I think uh, we're going to have more farms. I don't think that's going to, we're not going to decrease the number of farms. I think we're going to have more farms as companies continue to grow. Those farms are going to become larger and larger with more trucks and more risk. And also, we're going to have to adapt. Somehow, we're going to have to adapt to those conditions. But again, I wish we could grow in an organized manner so that we can try to avoid this kind of issues down the road. Because if we don't do that, we will never be prepared. And this is the question today. Do we have the people? Do we have the buildings? Do we have the veterinarians or employees ready for all these challenges? And when I say veterinarians, it's not that we have a huge influx of swine veterinarians into the world. We may have one here, one there. But again, all these veterinarians are going to be managing systems with 50,000 sows and their respective downstream flow, that could be pretty overwhelming if they have to do the health management, the biosecurity, the signing papers, the necropsies, the diagnostics. 
So that's kind of a lot of cells for one individual to manage, right? Now, and I think at some point, and I think we're seeing it already in certain parts of the world, people don't want to go on our pig farms and work. For some reason, they'll rather go to a supermarket, earn pretty much the same amount of money, they're going to be close to their families, they won't go home smelly, I guess. So we're going to have to find a way to really select those right individuals so that we can decrease that turnover rate, which I didn't talk about much, but there's some concerns in the industry with that. But also, how are we going to motivate them? How are we going to value their work? And there's, there's, a, there, there's a nice story in here in that two individuals in one production system, one of them would be washing trucks and one of them would be doing the power washing in the farming crates. Those individuals were so motivated that whenever you would ask them to do more, they will do it. They wouldn't be the ones that would just start complaining. No, they will do it. So I wonder how can we get the experience of those two individuals to contaminate, if you want to be, or an infectious, infectiously motivate all the other individuals at the pig farm level. That's not an easy task. And this is where I think we have to start looking at other industries, such as, I don't know, Sears, Best Buy, I don't know, Tim Hortons, if you will. They have to have a resource, a human resources manager that I'm sure they have gone through these conversations several times. So I think we have, to, we have a lot to learn from them. Because one thing is that, and this is, I think this is pretty clear in big companies, we need to empower these people. If we don't empower these people, they will never be able to perform as we want them to be. And when it comes to compliance, this is where we need them to be empowered. If they're empowered, I'm sure compliance is going to be better. Last slide, I think we need something that I didn't talk about just because of time more competition. What does this mean? The more we work together, even if my neighbor, I'm competing with my neighbor for prices or whatever it is, the more I work with my neighbor, even though if he's, if he's my direct competitor, the more impact we can have in our neighborhoods. And you can see, and this is something that is well known around the world now, the more they have all these alliances, of course, strategic alliances, the better everybody's going to be at the end of the day. An example of this is the Canadian PUD Control and Elimination Program. I'm sure some of them, they didn't talk amongst each other for a certain reason, but once PUD hit Canada, I'm sure they started talking again. So I think that's an example of competition because you're going to have, the more communication you have, the more ideas, and the more, the better the outcome. So I think that team approach has to, has to become way, way more widespread. Because we don't have to wait every time to have a crisis to start working together. I feel like humans, we won't change until we see danger or until we start suffering. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there that we can capitalize, and those can be capitalized in a very short time. With that, I would like to help you for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this talk, and again, I'm happy to be here in Guelph. Thank you very much.